on the intake of dry matter, milk production, and milk heat production was coming back to the level of the high protein level. Because this is one thing also that we don't know exactly why, but it seems that if histidine is limiting or is in short supply, there would be a negative impact on dry matter intake. Welcome to Rumination, the podcast that discusses everything ruminant. Hi, I'm Chris Gwynn, and today today I'm super proud and, and honored to be visiting with Dr. Hélène Lapierre, who is a research scientist with the Centre of Development and Research at Sherbrooke, or in English, as we'd say, the Sherbrooke Research and Development Centre for Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. Dr. Lapierre is well-known well-known throughout the agricultural and nutrition industry for her expertise and research in nitrogen needs of cows, protein, and in particular, amino acids. And we appreciate her joining with us today. Most recently, you'll know her for her involvement in the updating of the old NRC or the NASM that you've all been hearing about uh, these days on the upgraded requirements, and Dr. Lapierre was very much involved on the protein and amino acid side of that. So we're going to really appreciate her sharing her knowledge. And today, we're going to have an update on those amino acid and nitrogen requirements of dairy cows in the latest recommendations. And we also want to take a little bit more of a deeper dive into histidine, which we hear a lot about. Dr. Lapierre, thank you much for joining us here on Rumination. Thanks for the invitation. It's my pleasure. Dr. Lapierre, your, your research in amino acids, uh, your career in that area, it, it's been a large part of it. And could you expand perhaps for the audience on how you arrived at looking at nitrogen and amino acid requirements of dairy cows? Well, actually, it has been quite a long road. And uh, I did my bachelor degree at Laval University. And when I finished, I promised myself that I was never to go to graduate studies. But I got a job which was involved into research and really got into it. And it was so much fun to ask questions and answer those questions that I went for a master, but then was still not decided. I went to work in the finance for a while, and then I just got too attracted to into research. I came back to do a PhD at Sherbrooke University in Animal Physiology and then get the opportunity to go to work with uh, Henry Terrell and Chris Reynolds at the USD in Bellsville, Maryland. So I learned there a lot of techniques, and that was really nice to get something different. And uh, then I came back and uh, had a job at uh, the Research and Development Center. At that time, it was called Lennoxville. Now it's in Sherbrooke. It's always, we change address many times, so it's always the same place. And I've been working... Uh, then for, well, I've been working there for, for all that time. And actually, what was really great when I went to United States was I learned techniques where we really what we wanted to do was to follow the fate of the nitrogen that was ingested towards going to milk protein, but not just looking at the output. Really wanted to look inside the car what was going on and how the car was using this nitrogen in terms of amino acid or rumen degradable protein. So, um, you know, that, that, that was really uh, fascinating, I, I would say. And then it really brought some extensive collaboration and uh, development and adaptation of new technologies. And uh, it also in, in involved the supervision of grad students through all those collaborations. So that uh, I think that's the one thing which is absolutely fascinating with research is that it's a continuous process. At the same Absolutely. time, you're never in a, you're never in your comfort zone because you're always going where you don't know where you're going. You know, you're really trying to find something new, but go around. It's never boring. You're always like asking questions and trying ways to answer those questions. It's kind of like podcasts, always out of our comfort zone, right? Yeah, absolutely. For me, and, maybe not for you, but <laughs> no, no, I can assure you. And you know, so. 30, I think you said 30 years in that area and amino acid research has come a long way in that. And, and as you mentioned, learning techniques and discovering the techniques was probably a key part of that. Fascinating. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And that was a combination of different techniques. As I said, really the purpose was to look at what was going on within the animal. So we had different techniques. We could 
like use nutrients that were labeled with stable isotopes, which are different from the radioactive isotopes. So that really allowed us to follow really the fate. You know, this amino acid that the cow was eating, was it going towards milk? Was it going to be oxidized? Was it going to the muscle? And what was the trades between the different amino acids in terms of nitrogen shift and everything? So that, uh, yeah, I can talk for the whole afternoon if you want. <laughs> <laughs> Well, no, that's fascinating. And so speaking of talking for the whole afternoon, there's been all kinds of presentations ongoing about the, the latest uh, requirements that have been published. And so we're not going to take the full afternoon, but hitting on some of the key take-home points about for you, because you were involved in in developing that new module within the, the NASM, what, what are, you know, what to today, if a nutritionist asks you, what are the key points that they need to think about? What, what would you relay to them from that. Yeah, well, actually, this chapter was written all together with, well, all the committees in being involved, but there was much of an input from Mark Hannigan from Virginia mm -hmm. Tech and Jeff Perkins from the Ohio State University. And all of us really wanted to start with what we thought were the biological concepts that should be underlying all those estimations. So the supply was being revised the supply of protein, well, just to be a little bit more, um, the cow, the, the protein that the cows are digesting, about more than half are from microbial protein. The other 35% will be from the dietary protein that are not degraded within the rumen. And about 15% of what's arriving at the entrance of the small intestine will be just what we call endogenous protein. So slough cells, mucus, enzymes, you know, that are being secreted by the animal within the gut lumen. Mm -hmm. So there was a complete revision of each of those different fractions. So MCP, microbial crude protein, that was defined based on the nutrient that were digested across the whole tract in the previous system, which is not really the biology because it's occurring within the rumen. So we don't want to look at what's occurring across the whole tract. So now it's really focused on how much starch is being digested degraded into the rumen, how much NDF is degraded, how much nitrogen, and, and also the energy, obviously, which is always, uh, in, well, the starch, you know, and the NDF, which represents the energy. For the undegraded fraction, you know, we used the revised uh, tables, and the intestinal digestibility was also revised. And for the endogenous fraction, we recognize, actually, that at the entrance, as I was saying, of the small intestine, about 15% of the proteins that are arriving there are from, have been secreted by the animal itself. So before, it was accounted as a net supply. Now we're saying, okay, it's there, but it is being made from stuff that has been absorbed previously. So it's not a net supply. Okay. And it's a little bit technical, but for essential, for amino acid, for the essential amino acid, the previous NRC needed to use like a regression correction to fit the factorial, like the addition of microbial plus undegraded plus endogenous, whereas now just the factorial without any correction is giving good results. So this is somewhat showing us that the likelihood is that the biological phenomena have been well captured with this revision. Then the second point is that the prediction of milk protein yield in the old NRC was based on protein supply, metabolizable protein supply, and a fixed efficiency. Whereas the prediction now is being based on the supply of individual amino acids, five of them, isoleucine, leucine, I forgot, histidine, lysine, and methionine, but also the energy, which is very important yeah. too, because it's involved in the efficiency of utilization. And... Um, there is also a quadratic terms, which is showing that we will reach a plateau at a certain level. And for the recommendations before, it was as a proportional approach. So lysine and methionine had to be 7.2 and 2.4% of metabolizable protein, whereas now we have a factorial method for each of the essential amino acid and we express the requirements in grams per day, which is a big change as well. Yeah, because cows eat grams. Yeah. They do, indeed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And actually, depending of milk output relative to the other functions, 
this proportion actually will change because the composition of the protein outputs are different. You know, what is going into endogenous protein is different than what is going to milk. Which brings us to the topic of milk and high producing cows and, and how well I've, I often wonder, but I think you, maybe you, you, you can clarify how well these models are predicting the needs of these really, really high producing cows that we see more and more abundantly in the industry through because of management and genetics and nutrition. Are we predicting those requirements well? And is there anything different that the, the new model does to adjust for that? Well, actually, as I was saying, the prediction of milk protein yield is totally different from what it has been. And in addition, also, we recognize that when we develop those models, actually, we do use published values in the literature. Mm -hmm. But these, obviously, are cows that have been there before. They are not cows that we want to feed now and in the future. So to adjust for that, uh, what we did is that we included what we call the rolling herd average, which is in in French, the moyenne mobile du troupeau that we have with lactanet, which yep. is basically the average milk protein yield for a 305 day of production. So we have to input that number into the model, and that is changing actually uh, just through maths, the different coefficients predicting milk protein yield. So that way it's being taken into account of that, the fact that, okay, model has been built with cows that have been there, but we focus on the cows that we want to feed in the future. So this is oh. quite a, a new approach for this model. Yeah, that's great. Needed, yeah, obviously. Uh, so well done on that. And and histidine, you, you've you done your own work in that area. It's an interesting amino acid because commercially I hear a lot of requests for it. And uh, what about histidine? So may, could you give us an update on, on your thoughts with that particular amino acid? Yeah, we begin to be interested in that amino acid maybe like already yep. 15 years ago or so, right? And uh, because when we looked at the literature at that time, we could find a requirement. At that time, it was as a proportion of MP, metabolic protein, for lysine and methionine. But this number actually varied a lot between the different studies that had been conducted, and we wondered why. So we began to look at it. And at that time, it was proposed that it was with grass-based diet that this yeah. might be deficient, right? But then we conducted other work with cows that were fed with corn silage. And we, we found exactly the same thing, actually, is that actually the consumers, the demand for animal production that do have a lower uh, footprint on the environment. They really want to decrease they, they really want to see the producers, the nutritionists, to decrease the pollution which is um, raised, you know, that, that we do have with uh, the animal production, including the dairy sector. And uh, actually what we realized is that when you want to decrease the protein concentration of a diet, what happens is that the proportion of what is coming from the microbial protein is increasing. As I was saying, usually about 50% of the protein digested by the cows are from microbial origin. But if you want to decrease the protein that you feed, the crude protein that you feed to the, to the animal, then this proportion might increase to 60-65%. And all, although we have learned in our classes that microbial protein has a very good profile of amino acid, if you really look at the numbers, histidine in the microbial protein is low, is lower than in the feed ingredients. So mm. when you decrease the total amount of protein that you feed, you increase the proportion of microbial, so you decrease the proportion of or the quantity of histidine at a higher rate than you decrease what is being fed for the other amino acid. So what we demonstrated was that if you feed corn silage diet, if you decrease the percentage of protein of this diet, we're facing exactly the same situation as the people that were feeding grass-based diet when they were saying that it was that histidine was being in short supply. And when you look at those diets, effectively, they were really low in, in proteins. So in that aspect, what we found was that uh, when we decrease the percentage of the diet, of the crude protein in the diet, but we really look at 
we wanted to supply sufficient lysine and methionine through rumen protected lysine and methionine, those amino mm -hmm. acids that are protected from uh, rumen degradation, we still had a substantial decrease in milk protein yield and in milk yield. But if we had it histidine, actually the intake of the cow, or the intake of dry matter, milk production and milk yield production was coming back to the level of the high protein level. Because this is one thing also that we don't know exactly why, but it seems that if histidine is limiting or is in short supply, there would be a negative impact on dry matter intake. We haven't cut why exactly. So at that time, it becomes really critical to have enough histidine just to make sure that we have um, the that we maintain the high intake, which is needed to support the high milk production. Yeah, and really important in lactation. That's fascinating. Thank you for sharing that. So as as we kind of wind up a bit and and appreciating your time again to that nutritionist balancing rations today, taking into account carbon footprint and economics of diets and protein costs, what would be your, your take-home recommendations to them related to amino acid uh, balancing of the research that you've done? Well, obviously, I am totally biased by almost 40 years of research, right? But I would say that really to balance their rations for amino acid. It has been working for the poultry. It has been working for the pig. There is no reason why it wouldn't be working for the ruminants. Obviously, the challenge is larger because we need to determine what's being supplied through the microbes, through the, what's not being digested, degraded within the rumen. But I think that we have made really huge progress over the last two decades to develop rumen submodel. So we really need to focus and forget a little bit about protein, metabolizable protein and look for essential amino acid and please do not balance diets for crude protein. It is like so outdated and it is so it can be usually it's not that bad because people, you know, they don't feed foolish diets, right? But yeah. it can be so misleading if you just look at the crude protein. And the other point is that when we decrease the crude protein of the diet, that's a good point because it decreases the feed cost. It also decreases nitrogen excretion, but then we have to keep an eye on histidine because that might be the amino acid that will become in short supply. And finally, energy supply is also very important. It, it's a, often, you know, we're really going to merging actually the energy supplementation or the energy balancing and the protein balancing. You know, before we were like, balancing for energy, balancing for protein. And now we really have to merge because energy actually have has a big impact on how amino acids are being used efficiently to support all the protein functions within the animal. Fantastic. Thank you for sharing those thoughts with our audience today. And thank you. It's been a real pleasure to discuss with you your research and amino acids and histidine and, of course, the, the importance of blending energy in there so they all work. And so thank you for sharing all your thoughts with the audience today. My pleasure. Thanks for the invitation. Really appreciate it. No oh, pleasure. And thank you to the audience for listening. And, and just to remind you that you can subscribe to the Rumination Podcast at the jeffo.ca and so that you don't miss past episodes or upcoming episodes, you can find us at Jeffo's website, jeffo.ca, as well as on Apple and Google Podcast and Spotify. This podcast brought to you by Jeffo Nutrition, precision nutrition for a growing world. Thank you. <music>